whatever demographics, whatever um, cultural, um, it varies. It's like, hey, welcome to the human market. Human trafficking does exist here, and that it happens to any girl. Sexual trafficking makes up 85% of all human trafficking in the United States. 100,000 underage girls are estimated to be in the sex trade in the United States alone, making America the number one destination for child sex trafficking in the world. Who were the most expensive ones? The children. The younger they were, the more expensive they were. And I'm talking about 12 and under. Chong Kim, a sexual trafficking survivor, says sex traffickers do not discriminate between girls from overseas and those born in the United States. I met a guy that pretended to be my boyfriend, and he told me he wanted to take me out of the state to go meet his parents. We ended up going north up to Nevada, and I was actually trafficked out of Dallas, Texas, and then going into Nevada, and from Nevada, that's when he met the traffickers, and I was traded, swapped with the traffickers. What were you feeling at that moment? Back then, I just, I went through all different types of emotions that I never thought, I didn't even know that I even had those emotions. Anxiety, fear. There were moments that I would sit in a corner and just start crying. For three years, Chong was kept in a storage unit with 20 to 50 girls, repeatedly beaten, raped, and starved. Anything from putting their fist inside of us to a pipe, um, beer bottles, um, rape, sodomize, putting objects in, um, in our rectum. Despite common misconception, sexual trafficking does not just happen far from our shores. It occurs right here, every day, in our own backyards. With me being Asian, and Asian is more exotic here in the United States, they would keep me here in the U.S. Whereas the girls who are more Americanized or Caucasian looking, they would send them and send them to Germany, Amsterdam, um, Japan, Costa Rica, things like that. When you were in Nevada, how did they traffic you to New York? Through the warehouse truck. When we came through here, we also got dumped with multiple warehouse trucks because you're going from one side of the country to the other side. So I think about um, four to five different warehouse trucks we got transported through. It was like a human market. I felt like I was, I was a product. We would actually stay in New York for about a month to a month and a half, but we were being shifted through different um, businesses throughout New York um, for that whole time. There was a guy that actually was seeing me under the knowledge that I was a 13 or 14 year old Japanese girl. And I was, a, I was supposed to be from a foreign country, they thought I was, um, I couldn't speak English. So most of the times I literally felt like a meat because they would say, thank you for seeing me. But in a slow, they were like, thank you for seeing me. And then they would say, my wife would never let me do this. At that moment, I remember I would just try to find a painting. I would look up at the ceiling and pretend I was somewhere else. When you were brought to Chinatown, the, what was the storefront like? Was it a restaurant? Was it a nail salon? It was a restaurant, and in the back they would have, um, some of them were laundromats uh, to, you know, eat, just like you said, simple foot massage. You know, uh, some of them were a butcher shop, you know, selling meats. The businesses in disguise are endless. If we're talking more about massage parlors and uh, body rub locations, everywhere in Manhattan, from Midtown to Downtown Manhattan, they're all over. They're a dime a dozen. The officer spent three years undercover for a law enforcement agency here in New York City. He made over 600 attempted arrests and requested anonymity for this interview. If you're talking about street prostitution, 
8th Avenue from Port Authority, which is 42nd Street, up to 56th, down by the West Village, Christopher Street, Washington Street. You have prostitution houses where it's regular apartments. You have, depending how much you want to pay, depends on the neighborhood. Of course, Chinatown is going to be less. Midtown is going to be more expensive. Queens, Corona, East Elmhurst, prostitution houses, uh, out of apartments. Brooklyn, you have uh, Sunset Park, where you have a uh, Mexican community is picking up there, and then Sunset Park, you have prostitution homes there, uh, Sheepshead Bay, Coney Island. The Bronx, it's basically the same thing, it's all over. It's just finding them. For a place like this, say $35, and that was for the man to, whether it took him 15 minutes or half an hour, it was basically for the man's satisfaction, and it was like a revolving door. What happens to the people that you arrest? Let's start with the people running the place. And the first time offense is, like I said, basically sometimes just community service. So you actually get more jail time for being caught selling drugs than you do with selling people. Funny how it sounds, but yes, the crime for drugs is always, they enforce it so much more. In regards to prostitution, sometimes it's looked upon, well, maybe this girl is volunteering herself. It is this way of thinking which many activists are trying to change. How have you seen law enforcement change in the subject of sexual trafficking over the years? One of the issues that we've worked on quite a bit in these last few years has to do with the American kids who are exploited and abused in prostitution. Uh, for a long time, they were seen as bad kids who needed to be arrested, punished, reformed because they acted badly. And child prostitution and trafficking, ECPAT for short, is a leading policy organization working to protect every child's right to grow up free from commercial exploitation. Carol Smolensky is the associate director and founder. We work at the federal level to uh, pass laws and change policies so that kids are protected rather than arrested. Now, New York <clears throat> law in, a, in terms of sexual trafficking does not match federal law. At the federal level, there's a law called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act which was passed in 2000 and which defines any person under 18 years old who is, quote, induced to perform a commercial sex act as a victim of human trafficking. It means anybody under 18 in the United States is not a criminal, they are a victim. That does not match most state laws. And in New York, up until 2008, Youngsters as young as I said, as 11 years old, could be arrested for prostitution. In 2008, New York became the first state to pass a safe harbor law, which requires that minors under 16 arrested for prostitution-related offenses be handled by family courts. However, that only pertains to the youth's first arrest on prostitution charges and leaves many 16- and 17-year-old children treated as prostitutes with nowhere to turn to. New York is one of two states that treat them as adults. In fact, most people uh, forced into the sex trade are not literally chained, but there are mental chains that are used, force, fraud, coercion, to make you um, do what I, the trafficker, wants you to do. There's a continuum from, you know, on one end, chained to the bed, to at the other end, uh, just threatened, and terrified that if you don't do what you're told to do, that something bad will happen to you or your family. It was a mixture of verbal, mental, and physical abuse. Um, a lot of times I remember there was one punishment where he would make me face the mirror and I would be naked and he would hit me with a belt at the back. And he would make me scream out, I'm ugly, I'm stupid. He said, what are you? And I was like, I'm ugly. He goes, I can't hear you. And he would whip me. And I was like, I'm ugly. And he goes, and nobody wants you. Repeat it. So that way, when you're saying it to yourself, you start to believe it. What can we as individuals do or look out for to help end sexual trafficking, not only in the world, but specifically more to New York? There's no question that a big step forward will happen if everybody gets trained. I was talking about the hospitality industry training, criminal justice agents, cops have to be trained to have their minds 
understand that these are victims, kids, young people who have been abused and neglected their whole lives. But I have to believe in myself that there has to be hope. You know, it's going to take more than a group of small people that says we need to make a change. It's going to take more than a few cops saying, you know, we need to start busting these people. It has to take an army of people, an army of you know, passionate people to come together to say, this needs to stop. We need to stop ignoring it, you know, um, because without faith, honestly, I don't know what I would do.